Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, RichardDwyer.com. I'm a civil lawyer here in Northern California. From time to time, I look at reports from various trials where people have been convicted of serious crimes. And I try to re-examine the evidence and ask the question whether, in fact, the person was properly convicted. Now, sometimes this actually requires looking at cases with unsavory, and I do mean unsavory allegations of mental torture, abuse, manipulation of children. I understand that sometimes the views taken here on this website are not popular, but I do believe that we either have a legal standard or we don't, right? We either are holding our legal system to the standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, especially for murder cases, or we're not. Now what I'd like to do right now is to ask the question of whether someone convicted of murder in the state of Ohio, a woman named Judith Hawkey, right, Hawkey spelled H-A-W-K-E-Y, should have been convicted of murder based on this evidence. Right? I encourage you to Google the case. I believe the evidence is insufficient. Right? My own belief. I'll tell you it up front so you can filter my comments through whatever bias you feel I may have. Now here are the facts of the case. Her husband is to teach her stepson, right, the husband's child from a previous relationship, how to hunt, right? Now, he's found in bed with hunting brochures under his body. He's sleeping with earplugs in his ear, only he's not sleeping. He's been found shot to death, right, in his bed. Now understand the family is a blended family, right? It was he, his wife, his son from a previous relationship, her daughter from a previous relationship, right? It turns out there was life insurance. The life insurance is worth at least $300,000. The police come to the scene. The police question the wife, right? They ask about whether or not there's any life insurance. The wife says she doesn't know, right? They talk with the son who is 10 years old at the time. He tells them that his father was going to teach him how to hunt, that he was there in the bedroom with the father and the gun went off. Right? It's the 10-year-old's testimony at that time, or at least his statements to the police, that he killed his father accidentally. Right Now, the police are concerned that the father is wearing earplugs while in bed. How could the father have been talking to the son about hunting with earplugs in? Why would the father be wearing earplugs at that point in time? But the cops eventually convinced themselves that the 10-year-old is telling the truth. Right? That's the evidence. Now, 10 years later, right, a different set of facts emerge. Keep in mind, the 10-year-old continues to live with stepmom. Right? In the 10 years, they have some conflict. The son, while in high school, wants to play football. The mother, after initially allowing him to do so, starts to have concerns. Right? Maybe the concerns are health related. Maybe the concerns are time commitment related. But the mother starts to have concerns. 
right? She then prevents her son from playing football. Let me say this. I don't think she's the only parent in the United States who has stepped in and who has made a decision to prevent a child from playing in some organized sport activity. Now the son turns 18. The son then runs away from home. Right? Runs away from home. It's at that point that the son then starts seeing a therapist. And the son later confides to a teacher that he didn't kill his father by accident 10 years earlier. Rather, he was manipulated into doing so by his stepmom. Right? The son's story is that the stepmom made him out to be a problem child. She had him doing things along the way to make him come across as a problem child to his father, such as throw water on the father while the father slept, such as knocking things off of shelves, right, and then crying in videos. Right, that the stepmom used to convince the father to allow her to have a bigger share of responsibility in supervising the child than the child's natural mother. At one point, the natural mother actually relinquishes her parental rights. Right? The son, ten years later, claims that this was all part of a scheme to give her greater control over his life right to convince him to force him into killing his father who had over three hundred thousand dollars worth of life insurance right now the son claims ten years later right that the mother told him that the father had a brain tumor and was going to die from the brain tumor and that the son should shoot the father to take the father out of his misery right the son also claims 10 years later that the mother threatened him and said if you don't do this for us to help us get this life insurance money Right, that I'm going to kill you and no one's going to know about it. Right, so the son claims that his life was in danger at that point in time. Right, the son also claims that he kept quiet for 10 years because the mother told him, Look, I have recorded what happened in the bedroom when you killed your dad. And if you tell anyone our secret, that I encouraged you to kill your dad, that I'm going to give this tape to authorities, and you're going to be prosecuted. Now let's go through all of this. First, let me say this. Which one of us would want to be convicted based on the testimony of a 10-year-old? Right? I can tell you, you know, I was 10 once, right? I have stepdaughters who are a little bit older than 10. At 10 years old, I'm not sure if you're thinking as clearly as you should be, right? The son's present recollection is the recollection of someone who's thinking back to when he was 10 years old. Right? What exactly constitutes pressure to kill his father? Right? That's that's the first thing that concerns me. But let's dig a little bit deeper. The son talks directly to police at the time of the killing. He's 10 years old. Right? Now, what parent 
And I agree, there, there are psychopaths out there. There's some sick people among us, no question about it. But what parent is going to rely on the confidentiality of a 10-year-old in talking to police? Understand, had the son mentioned to police the idea that his father had a brain tumor, the cops could have then sensed something was wrong. They would have said a brain tumor. They could have then ta you know, checked with the father's doctor to see whether in fact he had a brain tumor. Then they could have pressed the 10 year old more and said, who told you your father had a brain tumor? Right, understand any statement like that would have killed what the son is contending was the version of events that the mother, you know, had set up. Right, think about it. Also, if the son, in talking to law enforcement, were to have said to law enforcement, you know what, my mom is threatening to kill me, right? Isn't that the time to talk to law enforcement, right? He's killed his father. He's talking to law enforcement directly, right? Any statement, such as my mom is threatening to kill me, I had to do this. Right? If the son starts crying and the cops suspect there's more to the story, then any plot by stepmom would have unraveled. Now, if that's evident to you, then doesn't that cast a doubt on the plausibility of a story where this was stepmom's plot? Right? If you're going to use a 10-year-old to kill your spouse, aren't you at risk? Because the 10-year-old is then going to talk to law enforcement. And if your plot involves lies to the 10-year-old, aren't you at risk of the 10-year-old spilling those lies to law enforcement who then will be suspicious? Also, which one is it? Right? Isn't the son's story? And don't get me wrong, I don't mean to cast aspersions on the son. I know he's been through a lot. This may be the way he remembers it. Right? But isn't the son's story a bit contradictory? Which one is it? Is this a mercy killing? Where stepmom says, Go kill dad because dad's suffering from a brain tumor and is going to die. Right? Or is this a killing to avoid being killed yourself? You know, if you don't kill dad, I'm going to kill you. Aren't those two at odds with each other? Let's go one step further. Take the brain tumor story. The 10-year-old son was close to his father, right? That's how he remembers it 10 years later, right? He was close to his father. Do you believe that stepmom would come up with the brain tumor story knowing that there was a risk that the son might actually ask his father about it? You might say, hey, Dad, are you okay? Are you okay? Dad could have said, look, son, you've asked me that 50 times in the last 50 minutes. Why are you asking me this? What do you think's wrong with me? Right? If the son had leaked the brain tumor story and would have said, hey, I heard that from step mom, mightn't that have unraveled the marriage? Wouldn't that have set off red flags? Right? And so, let me say this too. You know, there, there's a decade after the murder where the son continues to live with stepmom, continues to go to school outside of stepmom's control. Right? Now, during that 10 year period of time, 
And I understand he's under the threat of stepmom leaking some videotape that apparently doesn't exist. Right? During that 10-year period of time, is it credible to you that he would never have mentioned to an aunt, to a relative, to a teacher, to a another student, especially since the people at school know he accidentally killed his dad? That no, you know, my dad had a brain tumor. Or no, I, I killed him on purpose, but I was forced to do so by my stepmom. Now, curiously, it's not until mom doesn't allow him to play football and he thereafter runs away from home when he turns 18 that we get this version of events. Now, let's say you're a member of the jury. You have two different versions of events from the same witness. You have the one when he's 10. Right? That it's all an accident. That he's there with the gun. Dad is talking to him about teaching him how to hunt. And the gun goes off. He accidentally kills his father. Right? He tells that himself to police. Then you have the version. Ten years later. That his stepmom manipulated him into killing his father. Right? Because. Dad supposedly was terminally ill with a brain tumor. And because. He's, his life was at risk if he didn't kill dad. Right? Think about the second one, too. Is it believable that he's close to his father? And that stepmom then threatens him and says, kill your father or I'm going to kill you. Do you believe he would do so without first telling dad, hey, stepmom's threatening to kill me, right? Without telling someone, stepmom's threatening to kill me. Now, the son claims that on the day of the murder, he gets off the school bus. And stepmom comes over to him and for the first time puts her arm around him and says to him, hey, today is the day, right, that you're going to go forward with this crime. Now, there is a neighbor. There is a neighbor who says she was looking out and she saw stepmom put her arm around the then 10-year-old and that it was unusual because she hadn't seen it before, right? The police also know that the day after the killing, stepmom who told them she knew nothing about insurance policies was at the murder victim's place of employment apparently asking about the insurance policies. Now, have you heard anything in this video that would lead you as a juror, given the changing story of the main witness, to actually convict the stepmom of murder based on the testimony of the son and of the neighbor? But yet that's what happened. Judith Hawkey is in prison today, convicted in part of murder, as well as other charges, right? Um, you know, insurance fraud, child endangerment. Now, it's curious, right? Because, of course, the other daughter doesn't have any of the problems growing up 
that the son did. Right? Understand there's no third party who can come forward. Who can say, you know what? The son told me about the brain tumor story 10 years ago. Right? There's no therapist who can come forward and say, you know what? I spoke with him when he was 12. He told me about the brain tumor story. He told me he feared for his life. No one. How long would you live with a parent who forced you to kill the other parent? Right? This guy reaches age of majority. Doesn't he? Age of majority. Right now, it's possible that Judith Hawkey is a psychopath. And that things happened exactly the way the son now contends that they did. The problem is he had a different story at the time of the crime. Right? Proof beyond a reasonable doubt, to me, requires some kind of corroborating evidence, especially when the main witness has changed the story and has acted in a way consistent with the initial story he told police. Right? I question whether there is sufficient evidence here for the murder conviction that resulted. Right? Understand the son has given a few reasons why he committed this murder, right? A few reasons, right? Mercy killing. Dad had a tumor, right? Um, you know, mom was threatening to kill me, leaving me no choice. And of course, as for the cover-up, there was a videotape. I thought I'd be thrown in prison if mom released the videotape that she claimed to have of the murder. Right? The problem, though, is he didn't tell anyone about this for years. The problem is he lied to the police. I understand he's 10 at the time of the murder and, you know, could have been pressured into lying. But how credible is the idea that this was the stepmother's plot? Right? Dad has a brain tumor. Right? I'm going to kill you. Then I'm going to let you talk to police directly without fear of any of this coming out. Right? Also, how could mom be such a psychopath while having a daughter who seems to have had a good childhood in the same household? So, yes. I have a problem when someone is convicted of murder on evidence like this that hinges on changing testimony and not a lot of individual cooperation. Understand too the jury was so moved by the son's changed testimony that I believe Miss Hawkey got convicted in less than a day once it went to the jury. So I encourage you to look up this case, Judith Hawkey, right? H-A-W-K-E-Y, right? Who gets convicted of murder based on her son's changed testimony 10 years after the murder without any witnesses who can come forward and say, yes, the son told me this at any time during the 10 years before the son, after he turns 18, decides to change his testimony. It's a startling case. It's out of Ohio. Let me know your thoughts. If there is any evidence that you feel I'm overlooking, if you feel there is any evidence 
that you feel I'm misrepresenting. Let's have the discussion. I hope you leave that evidence and your thoughts on it in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.